Uh, all the young people age 11 and under, um, there's a class you can go to. Uh, going to try and use technology today. We'll see how well this works. Um, <clears throat> I did it for the Seder, so I figured uh, we'll see if I'm able to do it uh, here as well. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank David Haberman uh, for bringing the message last week while I was out of town. He actually covered two weeks of portions uh, because we had a guest speaker the week before and because there's not much you really want to emphasize in portion Metzorah, uh, which he thanked me for leaving him for a second time. Uh, the irony was, even though it wasn't the same two times, when I spoke in Atlanta the last time, it was this same portion because the uh, rabbi uh, had me come on short notice uh, because his, his wife had contracted COVID at that time. Um, but <clears throat> nonetheless, what, what I really talked about was Passover and uh, I'm going to discuss that a little bit tonight. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that it's good to be back with you but the reality is I've already been back with you because we had our Passover Seder on Monday uh, and <clears throat> I was back for that. Uh, I hope that was a blessing to all who were there, um, particularly to those who may have uh, experienced it for the first time, uh, either a Passover Seder for the first time or perhaps uh, just the way we happened to do it. Um, <clears throat> But there is meaning in these observances because they have been established by the Lord. So let us uh, just go to him in prayer. Uh, as Lord, we come before you this evening, Lord, and uh, we seek truth from your word. Uh, Lord, we seek uh, revelation for how to deal with the challenges of the times that we are living in. And Lord... Um, we seek the miraculous victory for Israel, the miraculous return of the hostages, uh, Lord, and we seek a, a miraculous uh, opening of a, 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 the hearts of our Jewish people to uh, be able to receive the revelation of your son, Yeshua, as the Jewish Messiah for Israel and for all the world. And Lord, we pray for favor with um, the sellers uh, of the property that we are looking to obtain. We thank you for the building that you have provided. And Lord, we are just looking forward to the harvest that you will bring. And I pray, Lord, that we would have the laborers ready and that the laborers would be of sufficient number uh, to bring many of our Jewish people to a knowledge of Messiah Yeshua. And we thank you for these things. And we ask you to uh, bless this time uh, Lord, open eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive from you tonight. As I ask that the words of my heart and the meditation, uh, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, would be acceptable in your sight, my Rock and my Redeemer. I ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> One thing that we see in the events of Passover is that it actually is painting a picture of two important themes: the blood of the Lamb and the deliverance of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. The blood of the lamb was applied to the doorposts of the Israelites' houses, and it would keep them from suffering the effects of the tenth and final plague, death of the firstborn. Now, one thing that's interesting is the Israelites were not exempted from the effects of this plague just because they were Jewish, just because they were the chosen people. Just because God had a covenant relationship with them, they had to apply in faith, as they were instructed, in obedience, the blood to the doorposts of the house and um, to the lintel. So that enables the Israelites to avoid what all of the Egyptians experienced that night, death of the firstborn of man and beast. And when Pharaoh realizes that his son has died, he tells Moses and Aaron to gather up the Israelites, and he tells them to leave Egypt immediately. Now, in celebrating Passover every year, we're to remember these events. We're to remember how it was the blood of the lamb 
that brought the Jewish people deliverance from death. And as Messianic believers, we can see that the sacrifice and shed blood of Messiah Yeshua brings us deliverance from the death that we deserve because of our sin, because of our rebellion against our Creator. His blood has been applied to the doorposts of our house, if you, if you will. I'm sorry, doorposts of our hearts, if you will. And that frees us from bondage uh, so that we are no longer servants to sin, but we can become servants of righteousness. As our people left Egypt, they were in such a hurry to leave that their bread did not have time to rise. According to Shemot, Exodus 12, verses 14 and 15, the Jewish people are to eat unleavened bread for seven days in memory of this event throughout their generations because leaven is seen as representing sin. And uh, the Lord wants us to know that he is able to bring deliverance from our sins. The unleavened bread also reminds us of the sinlessness of our Messiah Yeshua. And that is important. It's not just um, to present him as godlike as some might see it. We believe he was fully God, so let there be no doubt. But his sinlessness also enables him to satisfy the requirements for the sacrifice which had to be without blemish. The Passover lamb was examined for four days to make sure that it had no blemish before it was sacrificed. And his sinlessness is what enables us to share in God's righteousness, according to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, which says, He made the one who knew no sin to become a sin offering on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him, our trusting in Yeshua's sacrifice on our behalf is the way that we are able to experience the righteousness of a completely righteous and holy God. Otherwise, we have no way to draw near to him. We are in our fallen state. He is perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, and uh, I shudder to think what would happen if we were to come near in that state. But the work of Messiah Yeshua enables us to do what it says in Hebrews 4, verse 16, that we can not only come near, we can boldly approach the throne of God. Amen. So we've talked about Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which are the first uh, two annual Moedim for those following along in Leviticus 23, one of our favorite chapters uh, in the scriptures. It's kind of a chapter that Messianic Jews kind of have all to ourselves because most of the world is not too concerned with what it says in Leviticus 23. But those days are changing. Uh, I think that there is an awakening. We had a number of of people uh, from church congregations at our Passover Seder who were hearing a messianic understanding of that chapter. And we had a number of pastors uh, who have to decide, okay, what am I going to do with this information? And some of them come year after year. And I think that they're trying to uh, understand how can we incorporate that in the church world today, which uh, is a little bit of, of a challenge because you're going against tradition. And we can relate to that because there are times that we go against the tradition of the Jewish people. Really not all that often, but tonight is going to be one of those times. So that's what I'm getting ready to talk about right now. Uh, we talked about the first two. Moedim is the Hebrew. The first two appointed times, designated times, special times that the Lord has established. And now we're going to discuss the third appointed time, usually called first fruits. Even though the Hebrew word for first fruits is bikurim, and that's used uh, to, uh, as a description of what takes place on Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, which is seven weeks down the road. But um, it does say that it talks about the first of your harvest. Uh, and it's referring to uh, the instruction to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the barley harvest um, to the priest. But unlike the first two appointed times, 
uh, which are designated to take place on specific days of the month, this observance, this time of bringing the first fruits of the barley harvest to the priest, it says on the day after the Sabbath uh, is when the Kohen is to wave it. Leviticus 23 verse 14 says you are not to eat bread, roasted grain, or fresh grain until this same day. Until you have brought the offering of your God, it is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. This is a significant concept that we are not responsible completely for bringing forth the food that sustains us, that we are relying on the creator of the universe to provide. Uh, you know, the Jewish people of long ago, the Israelites, really had to trust because the seventh year, the sabbatical year, they only ate what the Lord naturally provided. They weren't even allowed to, to plant seeds to you know, make sure just in case it was a, a bad season. And the Lord came through every time. Otherwise, uh, our, our people would have been wiped out. Now, most of us are not farmers today. Um, <clears throat> I know I'm not. Uh, and so we obey this principle generally by giving to the Lord a tithe of the way that he has increased us, which is generally financially. So we combine the concept of bringing the first fruits with the tithe as we bring our offerings unto the Lord. And that's to remind us that he is the source of all of our blessings, <laughs> that we are reliant on him. Uh, and we can also give the Lord our first fruits uh, in other ways, in terms of our time and our talents. And we've seen that with many of the people uh, who have been involved in the process of renovating our new building. I haven't said it often enough. Um, I don't think any, uh, oh yeah, there, Fred. Um, that uh, Fred Scott is overseeing this effort and I am tremendously blessed that we have his talents and his capabilities because uh, I would be in serious trouble uh, and things would not be coming together nearly as well as they are. I'm excited to have y'all come out on Sunday and see the new building because it's going to look a lot farther along than it did the last time you saw it. Also, uh, Mick Jones has been there virtually every day. Uh, and I shouldn't say virtually, pretty much, well, that too. He's been there weekends in addition to the weekday, so um, I will give him 100%, if not more. And um, my wife has uh, been involved in a lot of the design effort, and that has freed me up to concentrate, uh, basically, on making sure that um, we have the money uh, and, and uh, keeping up with the budget and things like that, but it, it is just a, a tremendous blessing what the Lord is, is doing. It. And we talk about it over and over, but when we describe it, it truly has been a miracle in so many ways, and that's why we are believing and we're even perhaps confident that he is going to enable us uh, to get the land next door as well, even though it's been a little bit of a struggle. So we would appreciate your prayers um, for favor uh, and that this would be in accordance with the Lord's will. So thank you to all who have come. And to me, uh, one of the reasons that we have these work days is not only to get the work done, but so that you will feel when we are actually holding services in that building that you were a part of the effort to bring that to pass. And so we want to give everybody the opportunity um, to do that. When we bring the first fruits to the Lord, not only do we put our Heavenly Father before our own selfish needs, but we're saying to Him that we trust Him that He's not only going to provide what He has provided so far, uh, I've heard it described as it, he's going to provide 100% and he only asks for 10%, we get the blessing of the 90, uh, the, the 9 tenths. And so the reality is when we offer up from the first fruits, we're saying, Lord, I know that you are going to provide the rest, that you are faithful, you are a provider. You tell us first to uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will take care of our basic needs. And so we're trusting in him. 
Oh. Time for a show and tell. I need to. Oh. I need to get a new one. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, is once was able to hold food that wasn't eaten. And the reality is, um, do you know what we used to call these things? Doggy bags. There you go. <clears throat> Doggy bags. Because it started out as a bag, not a styrofoam container. It started out because a man lined a paper bag with aluminum foil and it put a picture of a dog on the outside so that people could bring the leftovers home to the dog. Uh, but the reality is, um, <clears throat> when it, it comes to what we bring to the Lord, we don't want to bring him the leftovers. There's a problem with leftovers. It, today, in most cases, the dog goes hungry because we bring them home for ourselves. But what frequently happens to the leftovers? Uh, they, we forget about them, and they get old and, and dried out, and we end up throwing them away. Uh, you know, certain foods, um, even if uh, we remember them, they don't taste quite the same the second time around, kind of like french fries. Have you tried? Uh, well, never mind. Anyway, there, there's foods that fall into that category. I always get a kick out of the fact that there are some foods that if they're cold, they taste nasty when they're warm. And there's other foods that are warm and they taste nasty when they're cold. It, it's just uh, interesting how, how that works. But the reality is sometimes the leftovers aren't even enough for a meal. You have to get some new stuff and add it to it, right? And so that is not what we are to bring to the Lord. And we need to make sure that we are not bringing the Lord our leftovers. You know, our, our flesh says, this is all I can afford to give. You know, I, I need this and this and this and this. And the reality is giving is an act of faith. It is trusting him to provide. So, uh, it's important that uh, we do what he has instructed us to do, which is bring the first and the best as an acknowledgement that we are trusting in him. And we actually uh, see an uh, uh, example of that with the offerings of Cain and Abel, uh, where Abel brings the first and the best. The Lord accepts it. Cain brings an offering uh, from the ground uh, that likely wasn't the best that he could have offered. Uh, and as a result, the Lord does not accept his offering. But the biggest thing to see is, are we bringing these things for his benefit or for ours? He doesn't need what we have. Psalm 50 verse 10 says, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. In verse 12, the Lord says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. Because the whole world is mine. The whole world belongs to me. So why should I expect you to provide when I am able to provide all that I need? So the first fruit offering is for our benefit as we acknowledge the Lord as the source of all of the blessings in our lives, as we learn to trust him more to provide the rest of the harvest that we may need. Now, since the priesthood and the temple no longer exist, the observance of first fruits today in traditional Judaism consists primarily of beginning the count to Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And the uh, counting in the Hebrew is called Sefirat HaOmer, the counting of the Omer, or the Omer. According to traditional Judaism and according to uh, all of my Bible commentaries, the count starts two days after Passover on the 16th of Nisan. But as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we separate ourselves from tradition, and the reality is about half of the Messianic rabbis, including me, see the scriptures as suggesting otherwise, ones that uh, were more raised in traditional Judaism or find themselves in the midst of a, tradition, a large Jewish community, uh, may choose to kind of go along, but I'm going to... Uh, kind of show you why um, I have come to that conclusion and why we uh, separate ourselves from the traditional approach. Um, <clears throat> Leviticus 23 five, verse 5 tells us that Passover takes place in the first 
uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the first month on the 14th. That's a literal translation of what the Hebrew says. Leviticus 23, 6 says in the 15th of the month, it is the feast of unleavened bread. Now, if first fruits is to be observed on the 16th day of the month, then it ought to say in Leviticus 23 in this passage, on the 16th day or the 16th of the month, that is when you are to bring the, the sheaf of the harvest to the priest. But Leviticus 23 verses 10 and 11 says, when you bring your sheaf, that's why it's called, uh, or the omer, uh, when you bring the sheaf of the first of your harvest. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is the barley harvest, which is the first harvest of the year. So we, that's another reason that this, uh, we talk about this in terms of the first of the harvest. Uh, <clears throat> he's to wave it before the Lord. It doesn't say, shisha asar, show off my Hebrew a little bit, the 16th, it says, Mi Maharat HaShabbat, the day after the Sabbath. And Leviticus 23, verse 15 says, On the day after the Shabbat, you are to count seven Shabbatot, or Sabbaths. According to the next verse, Leviticus 23, verse 16, the day after the seventh Sabbath will be uh when you bring a new grain offering and present it to the Lord, and this day is called the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot. Shavua means weeks, uh, week, singular, Shavuot, weeks, plural. Um, it's called Shavuot elsewhere because it takes place seven weeks after first fruits. Now, the term um, <clears throat> uh, Shabbat works the same way. Shabbat is the singular, and Shabbatot is the plural. And everywhere that Shabbat appears in the scripture, it means Sabbath or time of rest. And, you know, I just wonder why the Lord uh, would use uh, wording if, uh, that is so imprecise the day after the Sabbath if it was intended to be on the 16th of, Nis uh, of Nisan. And, of course, that also means the uh, calendar works out such that if first fruits comes on the 16th of the first month, then Shavuot will take place on the third, uh, the sixth day of the third month, the sixth of Sivan. And you'll see it that way on traditional Jewish calendars, including Messianic calendars, including the one we sell in the gift shop. But um, the reality is we look at the scriptures and it uh, seems like in the seventh week, okay, well, I'll talk about that in a moment, actually. So here's another reason that as believers, the New Covenant Scriptures provide another reason why the timing of first fruits is significant. In Matthew 12, verses 39 and 40, in response to the scribes and Pharisees asking for a sign, what does Yeshua say? The only sign that you will be given is the sign of Jonah, uh, the prophet. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. This prophecy cannot be satisfied with Yeshua being crucified on the 15th and raised on the 16th. So, <clears throat> therefore, even the messianic fulfillment is tied to um, the uh, first fruits not being uh, the day following the Sabbath of unleavened bread, but the day following the weekly Sabbath. And the question is, does the term Sabbath in Leviticus 23.11 refer to the weekly Sabbath as the Sadducees understood it, or as the Pharisees thought, and the way our Jewish people interpret it today, does it refer to the first day of unleavened bread when no servile work was to be done? Now, the Pharisees and the Jewish people today arrived at their conclusion that that is what it was referring to, the first day of, of unleavened bread, despite the fact that this day is never referred to as a Sabbath in the scriptures. And in Mark uh, chapter 16, verse 1, three women come at sunrise on the day after the weekly Sabbath, on the first day of the week, to anoint Yeshua for burial. 
Now, according to Mark 16, verse 6, it was a waste of a trip because they encounter a messenger who tells them, sorry, not here. Mm -hmm. He is risen. And so um, we, we see that the resurrection, which is one of the uh, ways that God has demonstrated his power to overcome the limitations of this world, is even tied to when these events are uh, took place in the first century. Romans 10 verse 9 describes two requirements for salvation. One is confessing with our mouths that Yeshua is Lord. And the second one is believing in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. That's how important the resurrection is. It demonstrates God's ability to overcome the finality of this world, the limitation of this world, the power of this world, death. And as believers, we have hope in our future resurrection. Not only that we will live again in glorified bodies, not only that we will experience no more hunger and no more pain, but we will spend the rest of eternity in the presence of our Creator. Amen. Uh, that is why we should no longer fear death, as Shaul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. Just after talking about our future resurrection at the final shofar, he writes, Death, where is your sting? That's actually quoting from Hosea 13, verse 14. And Yeshua was not only resurrected, but he predicted it in Yochanan, John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. After knocking over the tables of the money changers, he's being confronted by the authorities who question if he, uh, you know, where he has, what gives him the right to do that. And he responds, beginning in verse 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Judean leaders then said to him, 46 years this temple was being built, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But in verse 21, it says he was talking about the temple of his body. And not only do we see the fulfillment in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, the fulfillment of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, the, what are referred to as the spring uh, feasts, but um, the fourth appointed time, we've already talked about it, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, this festival is fulfilled by Yeshua in the sending of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. In John 16, verse 7, Yeshua says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, um, I think paraclete is the, the Greek word there, uh, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. So we see uh, the importance of observing these times. Observing first fruits reminds us that Messiah Yeshua was our first fruits, according to the verses that we read earlier from 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 20, he's described as the first to be raised into his glorified body, which is what all of us who ex have accepted uh, his sacrifice on our behalf will experience at some point in the future. Colossians 3 verse 1 says that he rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the appointed times also help us to see that Yeshua is coming back. That it's not just what he did when he was here, but we have the hope that he is going to return. The pattern suggests that he will fulfill the final three Moedim of Leviticus 23 at some point in the future, that he will take up his rightful place as king over all the earth, and he will rule and reign from his throne as king of this world. And where will that throne be located? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's why there's such a battle going on over there for that location. The adversary doesn't want that place to be available. The Jewish people did not have control for thousands of years. Uh, but in 1967, through the events of the Six-Day War, and they actually set it up so they would not get control of Jerusalem. They told the Jordanians, 
They said, if you don't attack us, we will leave you completely alone and we won't do anything to try and gain any ground in Jerusalem or launch any weapons against it. And what did the Jordanians do? Attack. They attacked. They sent weapons uh, towards the Jewish people and as a result, they fought back and they actually got control of Jerusalem, of the Temple Mount, for the first time in nearly 2,000 years. Uh, and so all of a sudden, uh, we now have the location where Messiah Yeshua uh, will establish his throne. And uh, <clears throat> not only will he establish his throne, but we, that is where we are going to spend the rest of eternity. Because it's not about going up to heaven. Heaven comes down to earth. The new Jerusalem comes down to earth. And that's where we will be as followers of Messiah. That's where we will be because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And for those eating only unleavened bread this week, it is my prayer that every bite of matzah will remind us of the Lord's power to deliver us from the bondage of sin in this world. It's not easy to, to eat matzah um, for a week. Um, your vacuum cleaner better be in good shape or your uh, broom because we end up with a lot of crumbs uh, wherever we're trying to eat. We actually uh, stop at Wendy's on Friday nights coming here and uh, matzah tastes great on a hamburger but it falls apart about halfway through so um, it uh, takes a little bit of an adjustment but it's, it's really a, a blessing as we reflect on these times that the Lord has established so that we might think about his truths. And I believe that there's, uh, first of all, Hebrew, uh, a lot of times words can be interpreted more than one way. Uh, and so that causes us to seek out, Lord, what did you mean? What did you intend for me to understand when these words were written down? Uh, and even in the observances of these appointed times, frequently we go by how our Jewish people have been doing them for years. But the reality is, in, in some cases, if they do it uh, different than what the scripture says, uh, that's where we kind of say, okay, we're going to have to do things a little bit different. So um, I just want to close out my message tonight by reading uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 24. Now, if Messiah is proclaimed that he has been raised from the dead, how can some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Messiah has been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, then our proclaiming is meaningless and your faith is also meaningless. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God. Because we testified about God, that he raised up Messiah, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, even Messiah has not been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Messiah have perished. Paul's laying out this whole argument where we're saying the whole time, no, 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 that's, that's wrong. It's the opposite of that. Uh, if we have hoped in Messiah for this life alone, we are to be pitied more than all people. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also has come through a man. For as an Adam all die, so also in Messiah will all be made alive. But each in its own order, Messiah the firstfruits, and then it is coming those who belong to Messiah. And then the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all rule and all authority and power. And it actually goes on. And the reality is um, that this is the hope we have, that Messiah's resurrection reveals that God is true. His prophecies are true. His power over this world is true. Uh, Daniel 12 verse 2 says of those who have died, some will be resurrected to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. What makes the difference? 
We believe it's having our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How do we get our names written in the Book of Life of the Lamb? By accepting the sacrifice of God's Passover Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. By believing in the resurrection. So right now with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here tonight and you've never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, tonight can be your night. All you have to do is raise your hand, say, yes, I want God's free gift of Messiah. It, it's not based on having the money to purchase it. Uh, the gift is priceless because it was purchased by the blood of God's own son. But in his grace, we are able to receive it for free. Will you accept God's gift tonight? Is there anyone? Maybe for someone who is watching on this video at some later point, uh, if you make the decision to accept that sacrifice, please contact, and let, contact us and let us know. Now, perhaps you're here tonight, and you're already a believer, but you've come to see that giving him the first fruits has been a bit of a struggle. Perhaps he's even shown you that it's more like the leftovers than the first and the best. But now you want to say to the Lord, you want to commit, Lord, you have given so much to me. And if all you ask is for the first part that I have received, I want to give to you the first and the best. Lord, I want to have a, a heart that is cheerful in giving to you for your reasons, for your purposes. And I realize that you are able to bless me as a result of this. Are you willing tonight to give to the Lord from the first and best of your uh, finances, your time, your talents, whatever he might uh, bless you with? Or maybe you need to trust him in some other area uh, that he has shown you where you've been struggling in the past. You can say to him tonight, Lord, not my will, but your will be done in that area. Because, Lord, you deserve our first fruits, the best of all that you have blessed us with. And, Lord, it helps us uh, when we give back to you not to take those blessings for granted, not to think that we've gotten them because uh, of our goodness, uh, Lord. But the reality is uh, you desire to bless all of us. And it's just in accordance with your purposes for the calling that you have placed on our life. So, Lord, we thank you for all your blessings, including the ultimate gift, the gift of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. As we say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done from this day forward. And we ask these things in our Messiah Yeshua's name. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen.